do you hear that sound? Signs of spring. So great time to welcome back another guest on the Home for Humanity podcast. This time I am welcoming Eric Spivey to the show. Eric is a transaction coordinator. I met him through the top tier transaction coordination course through the Pace Morby community. Um, he is a gator lender. He has a connector energy. He's so good at supporting people just through his energy and his words. Like he says in this conversation, he loves to talk. He loves being a resource and adding value to anyone in the real estate space. Eric um, first came, I first met him in a Zoom group for the Pacific team for the support group for the top tier transaction coordination course. And he provided so much value. And in that session with him, I had him solidified as the Batman of real estate. And that just clicked with me so well as we as transaction coordinators are supposed to have lots of tools in our toolkit and not just transaction coordination, but like Eric, for example, is also a lender and knows a lot about private lending, personal lending, hard money lending. And that's such an important piece in the real estate space and I'm learning more about it. Creative finance is not only a buzzword, but it's something that is really unique depending on the situation and depending on the market too. It can be really familiar or unfamiliar depending on what state you're at um, or in. So in this conversation, we talk about financial freedom. We talk about um, being the Batman of real estate, what kind of tools are in his toolkit. And I asked him about how he got into real estate, how truck dispatching is kind of like coordinating a real estate transaction. I ask him about integrity. We actually go for a long while about integrity and the importance of being an honest person in this industry. There are a lot of shady people out there in every industry, right? But in real estate, we need um, more honesty now than ever. You know, I'm sure you've heard fraud is on the rise. It's not anything new, but it's something that's happening. And people like Eric and Pace really and this huge new wave of people caring about putting more emphasis on the person who coordinates the paperwork side of the transaction. Um, historically in real estate, for those of you that don't know, that was kind of an undervalued role. And now that there are more and more ways to do real estate deals and coordinate the finance aspect of it, we're having more niche people kind of specialize in how to coordinate these transactions. And so Eric can, can get into that. You can reach out to him. He's a great TC. And um, let me know what you think of this conversation. Um, he has a really fun attitude and I really enjoyed talking with him and I hope to do so more in the future. So without further ado, I introduce to you, Eric Spivey. Cool. And I'm back with another episode of the Home for Humanity podcast where I talk to people about home and all the ways that being a human in um, home and why we pursue home and the work of home. And today I have Eric Spivey to talk about his work in real estate. And how about, yeah, who are you, Eric? Just take it away. Let's start with what's coming up. What's alive for you today? Oh, man. Um, so like she said, everybody, hello. And uh, Sarah, thank you so much for having me on. Um, being able to share my life experience, share work experience and everything like that. Truly, truly grateful for it. Um, but so for everybody that don't know, my name is Eric Spivey. I'm a real estate investor. Um, I am originally born and raised in Stockton, California, but I reside in Sacramento, uh, California, most definitely is home for the meantime. Um, I have been a licensed real estate agent for the past four to four and a half years. Um, I am also a certified transaction coordinator uh, and I am in the Gator community. Um, so <clears throat> pretty much... I, I consider myself like I, we talked about it before. I consider myself like the Batman of real estate. Um, so what I like to do is I like to have these. Um, we all know how Batman was. He wasn't, you know, uh, uh, he didn't have superpowers. He didn't have no special abilities or anything like that. He had that belt with all these gadgets on there is what made him Batman. You had his old gun. He used to shoot and clamp on to ring around and clamp on things to swing. He had his little little bat, little things where you stow and cut people with or whatever. We know all the Batman stories, but that's how I look at it. And that's how I pursue real estate is I want to have tools on my belt to make me a value to people when I'm doing business with them. So that's why I consider myself the Batman of real estate, because I want to have these things that I can use to help others who are pursuing their careers in real estate. 
Can I just say that when you said that um, in our Pacific group that you were the Batman of real estate, it hit me so deep. I have grown up calling all my different family members, Batman, Batwoman, my sister's Batgirl. And I had just watched Justice League the night before. So this archetype of Batman, and I love that character because, I mean, it can be argued that that is his superpower, that he always has a resource. He always mm. knows where to go to find the solution. He always knows where his friends are. He's tracking so many things at once and he's always in the right place at the right time. So um cool i thank you um i'm up here in washington so it's fun i grew up in the midwest so it's fun to be on the west coast now and it's a whole mm-hmm. the real estate um stories out here can be so different um can you would you mind explaining what gator is oh great great yeah so gator is it's a plethora of things right so i'll get down into the nitty-gritty of things so a lot of people may not know uh, a gentleman by the name of Pace Morby, great, great real estate investor, great, great individual, great father, great mentor, just a great person overall. But Pace Morby has put together um, a group of individuals that have funds that we are working together to deploy for real estate transactions. So a lot of stuff that we uh, uh, so we JV with people and also we lend money as well, which are two totally different things. But in the Gator community, we work hand in hand with wholesalers and investors. And what we do is, is we fund EMD transactional funding. We do double closing. We do uh, gap funding. We do uh, also now we're doing PML deals as well. So what it is, is a group of individuals that Pace has gathered together, a great group of individuals. Let's add that in there to where we work together to fund deals for real estate transactions like yourself, investors, uh, PMLs, uh, uh, people that are wholesaling deals that need EMD, investors that need gap funding for the fix and flips. Uh, so that's what we do. We fund real estate transactions. Yeah, that's, that's. Um, I guess for even my friends that don't know, I became a top tier TC student last <laughs> fall. And so I, it was my second listing as a real estate agent last year. And I was having all these people ask me about um, direct to seller financing. And I was like, mm-hmm. I, I it, real estate school didn't really prepare me for that. So I, I had Pace Morby was on my radar and this course came up and that's how I met you. Um, and so I feel like I'm just now learning this whole other world of the funding side. Um, and I meet investors too, who are doing really amazing work in mm-hmm. communities and like taking that money from their investments and putting it in back into the community in cool ways. And so, um, I, I think there's this whole side of real estate that's like, that's the money. And that's something that mm. people without a lot of financial education, I, I mean, I, I'm still learning and I feel like it's my job to help educate others that, that the way money works in, in mm-hmm. land um, is a really real piece and it's a really important piece. So um, I'm curious, like in your experience so far in these communities, like what kind of stories have you seen um, like happen. A real estate transaction is like a real alive thing. Um, what kind of like maybe the good and the bad and the beautiful, or I don't know how you want to, of like uh, what kind of is that made on you. All right, great. So let's let's talk about a good story that um just recently happened. Then I'll give you a bad story that happened. And <laughs> one of the good stories that I want to share is is that. Obviously, us that are in real estate, we're obviously chasing something, right? You always talk about your why, right? So we have our why in real estate. And one thing that me being a man of God, I'm always big on love and relationships and giving back to the community and doing for others, right? Because that's just kind of how I am. But that's also how God wants us to be. Right. So um, Pace had uh, I mean, event. I forgot the name of it, but it was literally across the entire U.S. with the sub two Gator and top tier TCs where everybody was getting together to donate for calls around Thanksgiving. And for me, it was a great thing because it gave me an opportunity to be able to give to somebody that was less fortunate and able to network and talk to other individuals that are doing what I'm doing that also have a mindset and a heart similar to mine that want to just give back out the greatness of our hearts. So for me, um, we make good money. We make a lot of money. We make little money, whatever we're making. I feel like it's always great to be able to give back because when you give back, God is going to bless you tenfold. So it's just always good to be able to give back. And so that's a good story. We got together with a couple Gators, a couple 
uh, sub two students out here. Um, I think we went to Roseville and we just donated a bunch of stuff like diapers, uh, wipes, tissue, uh, uh, um, um, just a bunch of different stuff where we would donate it to families. And that right there was a great thing. And this was put on by Pace. Pace encouraged us all to get out and do it. So that was great. Um, so I want to tell you kind of a, a of a bad story. And this is coming from the TC side of me. I had a deal. We're not going to use any names. I had a deal where a gentleman um, was already getting ready to getting ready in the deal. They were already trying to pretty much disperse funds. And they brought me into the deal late to kind of oversee everything because things were kind of at a halt and they couldn't figure it out. So the gentleman sent me his JV agreement. And once I review his JV agreement, I'll look at the other documents, the purchase agreement, the addendums and things like that. Now I have a picture of what this deal is doing. And so once I look at the JV agreement and compare it to what was going on and had a conversation with the with the actual gator that brought me onto this deal, I end up saving this gator from giving out or paying <clears throat> an extra $7,000. And what happened was, excuse me, what happened was, is they put a percentage in there instead of the dollar amount. And that percentage was going to be $7,000 more than the dollar amount that they were supposed to get. And so for me, and this is why it's always good for um, people in real estate to use a transaction coordinator, because it gives you an extra set of eyes, yep. give you an extra <laughs> set of eyes to be able to look at the deal to help you possibly catch mistakes you have made we're human we all make mistakes you, you can be looking at a contract you can be tired and because you're tired you can overlook stuff and having an extra set of eyes can sometimes catch those things that you miss so with that they almost gave up an extra seven thousand dollars simply by just making a mistake and not catching it so yeah. that would have been a horrible situation yeah eyes on contracts eyes yes. on paperwork so get you a TC. Get you a TC. Eric's a <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, get you a TC. I, I, I've been thinking of an analogy you made a while back. Speaking of TC work, you said it's like truck dispatching. And oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I, th I think people in real estate who, who do all different things in real estate, which is such a huge, broad industry, come from actually tangential or not related at all industries. Um, and you came from truck dispatching how is mm -hmm. it similar and what yeah what kind of work all you? right so cool so i'll give you i'll give you a little bit of a backstory so um about when we were in 24 so about 10 years ago i got into truck driving so i've been having my cdls for about the past 10 years um and so what i did was uh, i want to say maybe two years ago i ended up going off and opening up my own trucking business but before i had the trucking business i had a dispatch business Right. And this is why I like to compare dispatching trucks to TC work, because it's very, very similar into the to the what you're doing. So like in truck dispatching, we will call the we will call the shippers. We'll book the loads. We'll handle the paperwork. We'll handle the payments. We'll handle the file. We pretty much handle everything for the truck driver to allow the truck driver to continue to work without having to worry about the logistics side of things on the backside. Now, when you come over here and you talk about TC work, we're doing the same exact thing. That it's just a different party. So over here in the dispatching side, it's a truck driver. Over here, it's a real estate investor. And so as a TC, what we do is we handle all their phone calls, paperwork. We handle their files. We make sure things are going right. We make sure they're getting things signed, making sure that we're getting proper documents, making sure proper uh, protection is in place. So we're pretty much, in a sense, their dispatcher on their on their paperwork making sure everything is falling in line so they can get their file at the end and get the deal closed at the end it's the same thing with the dispatching trucks making sure that that truck is getting there with that delivery safely making sure all the paperwork is together make sure payments are coming out on time making sure that uh the shipper receives everything make sure the carrier is getting everything you know and just transporting paperwork back and forth getting things signed it, it's 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 real identical Mm -hmm. how how long did was it doing tc work that you kind of started to get that flow down um i mean like that i mean the flow i guess would be very very identical like you just said but like mm -hmm. was there a lot of like education that you had to do around real estate transactions at the beginning did it feel like a new thing for you to learn 
Um, yes and no. And the reason why I say yes and no is because I've been in real estate for the past four years. So a lot of the real estate lingo I already know and understand because I've been a real estate agent for so long. But some of the things I didn't know, right? Just because, uh, especially when you get into the creative space, like you said, in real estate school, they don't teach us anything about creative real estate. I literally learned about creative real estate like the past six to eight months by just binge watching YouTube videos by Pace Morby and then connecting with his students that kind of give me gems here and there. So I'm catching on to learning creative financing. And so when I got into the TC work, because I don't do traditional TC work. And so for everybody to understand what that means, traditional is you know, the, the original method that we all learn, you know, hey, get a get a lender, go to a lender, get a real estate agent, get a loan, use your credit, use your W-2, all these things. That's the traditional way. When you get over here with us in the creative space, we don't use any of that. We just use other people's money, OPM, and we and we work with others and get deals and stuff. And then so when I got into this space, that stuff was the part that was brand new to me because I didn't know nothing about creative financing. But once I learned creative financing and I start plugging those two into with the traditional stuff, it became a lot easier because the verbiage is almost the same. But like I had to learn about like what's a wrap, what's a sub two, what's an owner financing, what's a novation, like those things like that I had to learn because they don't teach us that in real estate school. So that's why I say it's yes and no. I I have a hard time explaining to some people now, like now that I'm kind of am on that edge, like just switching into what most people consider like on market traditional real estate. And just mm -hmm. I'm hearing from lots of different ways. It seems that like this off market creative finance world is just becoming more popular. More people are asking questions about it. More people are learning about it. Do you mm -hmm. think that's true? Like, or, uh, or <clears throat> why is there such a, a difference, I guess? More, a lot of people are like, wait, what? what? Why is there an on-market, off-market thing? Yeah, so the on-market... So, so I'll, I'll give you a deep dive like this, right? So the on-market is stuff that are people that want to sell their homes, and we're conditioned to always go with the real estate agent because we don't really know any better. Nobody teaches you or really tell you anything about anything else. So we always go to a real estate agent. As a licensed real estate agent, you know how it goes. Our, our responsibility as an agent is to put our stuff on the market because that's what the NAR requires for us to do is put our deals on the market. Now, sometimes we do get pocket listings and sometimes we do have individuals who are like, hey, I want you to sell my house but I don't want it on the MLS, but we have to get a document signed saying that they don't want it marketed on the MLS. And that would be something kind of like a pocket listing or something that's uh, what's off market, but it's on market, but it's really off market because it's not on the MLS. But and it's anywhere so, the agent wants it to be. Anywhere the agent wants to be. So sometimes you'll have people that sell a house and they don't want to sign in their front yard. Right. Because they just kind of wanted to keep it quiet, keep it incognito. And then that's why it's always good to have a good buyer's list because you can just market to your buyer's list and stuff like that. Um, and I think the, the the big difference between off market and on market right now is a lot of the houses that are on market are selling for market value. But interest rates are so high that a lot of people don't really want to buy on market deals at market price with these high interest rates. So what they do is they try to connect themselves or wholesalers, excuse me, investors, sub two students and students of others, uh, other groups that are doing deals off market because sometimes those people off market are getting deals for a cheaper rate. And then sometimes like in, in sub two, we're taking over deals. Well, I'm, I'm not going to say we, cause I'm not in sub two yet, but I will be shortly, but what people are doing is, is they're taking over these deals subject to where they're taking over people existing loans. And a lot of these loans are got two to 3% interest rates. So I don't really know if people understand, but a three or 4% difference in interest rate is a difference between thousands of dollars a month on your mortgage, $2,000 a month on your mortgage. Like it's a big difference on your PITI when you go from a two or 3% to a five or 6%. So that's the, the big difference I see. I, I find this, um, so I find just, just this interesting and thank you for breaking it down like that. Cause mm. there's something about that option. Like you said, that a lot of people just like they, they we are told, well, the call a real estate agent, they have a handle on how this transaction can go through. Mm. And 
I, th I think even that basic awareness that so many people have, and I still meet people and, and talk to lenders who say, you know, mortgage bankers and that, well, it's very normal that a large, that people can get priced out of the market if they don't act now. And that's a selling mm -hmm. or a marketing, um, or a negotiation point, I should say that like, well, there is the reality that you could get priced out of the market if interest rates change like this. And then the solution that I actually talked to a lender a couple months ago was like, well, then they would have to just find if they could find another job that bumped them up an income bracket, that's their, that's their next step. And that's the solution. And there's something that's, that's unattainable about that pathway for a lot of people that there's mm. something that doesn't quite feel like there, there's almost this desire for me that people should actually have all the options put in front of them. And if that's my job as an agent to actually put all these options in front of people, um, whether they're buying or selling, it makes sense to me that uh, both of all of these pathways, what we now consider on market and off market should be presented to people. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I think I, I agree with you because when we get these deals and, you know, with the current interest rates and things like that, I think it's important for people to understand that there are different ways to purchase or sell a property mm -hmm. uh, than just the traditional route. And that's something that Pace calls a unicorn agent is an agent that understands the traditional ways, but also understands the, the creative ways. And when we understand them both, we know how to attack or I want to say attack because it sounds so cruel, but we know how to handle or manage deals that we get that come from a buyer or a seller when it comes to us because we understand both sides. And me as a, as a real estate agent for the past four years, I was so uneducated on creative financing. All I knew was, hey, let's put on the market, see what offers we get, negotiate that way. Now when people bring me deals and let's just say if they have no equity in the deal and they're like, hey, I know my house is worth X amount of dollars, but I know if I put it on the market, I know that I'm going to end up having to write a check because I have no equity in the deal. So that is a great way to be like, hey, you still can sell this house. Let's mm -hmm. sell it on creative financing. So that way you can still sell the house. And then you don't have to worry about cutting a check at closing because you because your house doesn't have any equity in it. So I think it's great for people to understand that you can buy outside of traditional buying. Where where would like basic real estate agents go to learn that? Is Pace Morby's uh, YouTube the best? Place? Go to Pace Morby's YouTube uh, <laughs> network. So so for for people that don't know, if you watch this video and you live in the Sacramento area, I'll give you guys my my IG handle later. But connect with me because we have real estate meetups here that are sub to and Gator and TC ran. And most people don't know about it because it's mostly put out in our groups and stuff. And I try to share it on my Facebook, but even up in Washington, I'm sure that they have Gator mm -hmm. sub two meetups and stuff yeah. out there too. So these real estate agents can get in these groups or get in these REI meetups, network with people that are already do it and pick their brains. That's how I learned. I ask a lot of questions. And then, so for me, I'm not a person that can read a book and just really, really grab onto everything. I have to have a conversation about it for me to really, for it to really stick. So I have a lot of creative finance conversations. I mean, pretty much daily, right? And I'm not even in sub two and I can pretty much do a sub two deal minus the paperwork, but I understand it because I have so many conversations about it. So for a real estate agent that doesn't know about creative financing, get yourself around people that understand creative financing, pick their brains and implement that into your real estate business. And it's going to help you so much more. Nice. Thanks. Good tip. And yeah, yeah. like working on the, working on a buyer's list, working on an email list. Is that another big one that you focused on the past few years. Yeah, so I'm I'm even doing that now where um where I'm starting to put myself out uh in in these Facebook groups because there's a lot of wholesale groups, a lot of uh creative finance groups and stuff like that and um uh, putting myself out as hey, like you know, if you guys are looking to buy or sell even if creative financing or if you need me to speak to a seller about creative financing or anything like that, then reach out to me, let me know. And I'll give you a great example. I have uh, a lady that just came to me off of one of my posts the other night and I put a post out like, hey, I'm a creative finance buyer. Um, I understand creative financing. I'm also a real estate agent. I have this amount of experience, such and such. And I kind of gave a little spill about myself. And this lady inboxed me like, hey, this, this house that I really, really want, 
um i don't i don't i don't have the cash per se to buy it but i want to see if they will take a creative financing deal on it can you reach out to them and, and see if they will be open to a creative financing deal so for me being a real estate agent i'm comfortable calling people because we do a lot of phone calls and mm -hmm. usually when i call people uh, i talk to people about buying and selling but now i'm calling real estate agents about their listings hey you have this listing i have a client that is looking to buy this property but they want to see if they can get it on creative financing a lot of agents are going to be like, oh, what is that? Because that's what I would have did. What is creative financing? I don't understand it. And then to me, having the knowledge that I have from friends and stuff, I'll spill it out like, hey, so subject to owner financing, maybe a hybrid deal. Uh, it can be a wrap, novation, uh, uh, lease option. Uh, 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 um, you have uh, wraps and all these different type of things. Now I can give them a spill of what creative financing is. And it makes it a little bit easier. Now I'm educating them on it. So now they can be like, oh, I never knew that that. Let me go look and get more education on this too. So it, it always helps to know it. What kind of other meetups do you do in Sacramento? The what kind uh, of what kind what's the community like down there? You go to a lot of real estate meetups and investor meetups, but so I, I I don't do much. Um, and that's my fault. I need to do more because as a real estate agent, you know how it is, our business thrive off of relationships. Uh, as an investor, our business starts off for relationships. Um, so I, for right now, I've been going to the uh, Sub 2 Gator meetup every second Saturday of the month. I, I try to get to that every every uh, week, every month, because we have so many new people coming in. And then also I like to go and just give out information and and life stories and stuff like that to people that come, especially new people, because I really, really love to help and educate people on stuff that I'm learning. I got to, I like to talk. So it's a great for me, but I am going to start implementing going to more REI meetups, more real estate events and stuff like that, because I want to get myself out there with people, network with people, talk to people, let people know what I'm doing and really build those relationships because building those relationships is what's really going to put me in a position for financial freedom but also be able to educate others on what's available out there. Cause a lot of us don't know. So I got to do better. <laughs> Same. I think that there's that phrase. There's always room for improvement. Um, yeah. But you mentioned financial freedom. What, what does, what does that look like for you? Or what, what I think in real estate, so many people are chasing that and maybe it's for passive income or maybe it's time mm -hmm. freedom. What does that look what does that look like for you? So for me, for financial freedom and, and me and my little brother, we have this conversation all the time about financial freedom and stuff. For me, I'm not a person that has to be rich, right? I don't have to be rich. I don't have to be a billionaire and all stuff like that. I'm a simple person. Um, but financial freedom for me is one having time freedom because I'm very, very family orientated. I really love spending time with my girls and my daughters and my sons. So I, I really love spending time with family. And I know, and and this is not a, a rock throwing at anybody with a W-2 or anything like that, but time freedom is very huge because every time that I had a job, I always had to ask permission to have time away or to step away or, hey, I need to take care of a family member. Or I need to go on a trip. I always had to ask for permission. So I always miss stuff because of exchanging time for money. So now I'm trying to be in a position where I'm making my money work for me versus me working for the money. So uh, I always say this little funny thing, and I think you asked me uh, a while ago too about a joke. I want my money to make babies. <laughs> that's what I want. I want my money to make babies mm -hmm. and grow and multiply. So that's a big thing for me is uh, financial freedom, um, really being in a position where money isn't a problem. It's not a, it's not something that I got to live paycheck to paycheck on because I know a huge portion of the U S live paycheck to paycheck. And I don't want to live like that anymore. I want to, you know, make enough money to where it's not a problem. Everything that I have is taken care of. I want to reach a new tax bracket and still live in the tax bracket I'm in because I know a lot of times what we do is, is we start making more money. We start spending more money. And then we're still in the same boat. So I want to make more money and live my life the same way I'm living it now. Mm. Yeah. Mm. What a rich answer. Um, I, th I think there's that, <clears throat> I mean, God, just in my lifetime, seeing inflation and what it's done to just people's access to things. Um, yeah. And the, even investing, learning, learning that, learning that just saving and holding on to it 
will you will watch it disappear and your money won't their money won't make babies because the cost of money itself is going up yeah and it's just, it's just a wild and hard th- thought for me because there really is this mindset change around money that mm-hmm. i've had to go through and a lot of people have had to make that shift when they move away from a w2 into something else yeah that that is just like it's gonna live or die and my future is in its hands <laughs> yeah i would um, say i would say this one of the things that i've kind of start paying attention to so outside of all of those things that i do as far as a gator i uh i put a big emphasis on raising capital right and the reason why i put a big emphasis on raising capital is because one i'm trying to do a lot of real estate deals and i want people to see what i'm doing and invest in what i'm doing also i want to teach them what i'm doing so they can invest themselves but <clears throat> one thing that i've learned is is what raising capital is a lot of people don't really understand how money works and how it moves and how you get yourself into a different bracket. And what we're taught is, is, Hey, you know, get a job, open up a bank account, have your money sent to the bank account, save your money in the bank. And what happens in the bank is the banks are using your money to do whatever it is that they're doing with your money. They're putting your money in the stock market. They're trading your money. They're letting people borrow your money. Like they're, they're doing all these different things with your money and they're paying you pennies on a dollar as far as interest on your money. So what I like to tell people is, is when you come in and invest with me in real estate, you can get a between 10 and 15% return on your money. There's no banks. There's no, uh, I don't know what they call it, IULs or all these different type of things. A uh, 401ks is going to pay you 10 to 15% on your money. So my opinion, and I'm not saying it just because I'm a real estate guy. I'm saying it's because I've seen people try to save money and it just doesn't work like that. Park it in real estate. And then you can become, if you become a PML on deals that people are having, I'll call it mailbox money. You literally get paid money for parking your money and you get a monthly check. So for example, I I spoke about this when I was doing one of my YouTube videos. I had somebody that brought me 25K for a deal. Um, I believe I paid them 12% interest on that 25K. They're getting 250 a month for 12 months. Now, 250, 250 a month may not be a lot of money to some people, but for some people, that's a lot of money to get extra for you not doing anything for it. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? So once you can start elevating that 25K to 30K to 40K to 50K to 60K, now your monthly payments increase. Now, just imagine if you have 75K and you have 25 here, 25 there, 25 there, now you're getting 750 a month. That take care of a car note. I mean, car notes, car insurance, that could take care of half your rent, half your mortgage. And the best thing about it is, is you don't have to own real estate to do this. You can invest with someone else and get paid in mailbox money. You can literally still work your W-2. You can be going, I don't know, to Hawaii or whatever and get a paycheck every month. So it, it's park your money in real estate. And there's, there's this like spiritual <laughs> um problem in my that's coming into my mind because so many people i know and this goes back to like financial education or and mm-hmm. education and just learning about how real estate works in general um that for a lot of people i think real estate investing in it and private property itself is mm. such a tricky issue and they and a lot of people either don't have they want nothing to do with it Mm-hmm. They see any money involved in a real estate investment as um, like icky or like mm-hmm. wrong, maybe. And I am just thinking of a wonderful conversation I had with someone who went, who kind of talked about like the love of, for the creation versus the creator. And I think there's also the same dichotomy in real estate of like, mm-hmm. well, do are you know, are we profiting off of something that God gave us and like mm. this trickiness in that? And, and my solution kind of is to take it from a, a financial education standpoint and be like, well, here's what we're working with. Here's how it works. And if there's a way that I can even encourage people like, and, and I'm kind of thinking of like my hippie friends who just want to live out in the woods. And I, and I am one of those people, I think sometimes and I, it, learning about this does feel hard sometimes. And so I mm. guess what I'm getting at is, um, we, when we, when we get real with money and when we get real with land, um, mm. this is the kind of work that I, I feel like a lot of people can bring a lot of intention to good intention to, um, in the midst of 
what a lot of people can perceive as bad intentions. Mm. Um, and I feel like I see someone like you, I see someone like Pace Morby, um, and a lot of the people I've met in the top tier community have really, really good intentions and they're out there like transacting on stories that in a positive way. And mm-hmm. I just want to bring that to light, I think. Um, yeah. is that invest real estate investing kind of has this story and well, that's even in Molly's course, right? That like wholesaling kind of gets a bad rap. And it does mm-hmm. from the NAR standpoint too. Like I know those realtors. And so Yeah, yeah. 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 I, I guess what's one of my questions that I actually had was like, what's the biggest change you'd like to see in this industry? Is there Ooh. um something that that you also see as like that could be different. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I would say, um, and just kind of going off of what you said, then I'll, then I'll answer that question for you. Yeah, uh, real estate is tricky, right? And and it, it's tricky, especially for people that are uneducated on how real estate works. Right. So it's very untrick. It's very tricky. I think the, the best thing is, is a lot of people have great intentions, but just because you have great intentions doesn't mean that everything happens that way right now you have some people that don't have great intentions and can tell you they have great intentions but they really are hidden behind it you got to check their work and see what they're doing so anytime that you're investing in real estate with somebody background check them ask people about them go to their mutual friends see if you got mutual friends and ask them hey have you ever worked with sarah what is sarah like does she pay people back like ask people questions and you'll find out very easy what kind of person you're dealing with if you simply just look into them right now for me what i would like to see change in real estate um one i would like interest rates to get better that would be great because a lot of people want to own homes but a lot of people don't want to buy with these high interest rates um i mean fed said they're going to drop it three times this year and three times next year but like I tell people all the time, man, we don't know what they're going to drop it. They can right now it could be 7% and then tomorrow it could be a 6.5. I mean, that's not really a big drop. You know what I mean? Some people are like, oh, I'd rather buy the 6.5 than the 7. But I mean, it's going to change your mortgage payment, you know, I don't know, $200, maybe $300. If that, it's not a big drop like that. Um, But the biggest thing that I would like to see change in the real estate world is, um, People doing dirty work to people. I, I really hate people. And I don't want to say hate because hate. I dislike people that do shady stuff to people. I don't care what avenue it's in. I don't care what business it's in. In life, I just don't like. I dislike people that do shady things to people. And real estate is one of those avenues where you can make a lot of money. But you also can lose a lot of money because there are so many different type of frauds and different type of scam or ways to scam people inside of real estate. Like even when sending money to title and stuff, you can have somebody hack an email and change the uh, the information for uh, a wire transfer. So that's mm-hmm. why as a TC, that's why we always say, hey, call the title company and confirm these numbers before you wire anything. Even if it's coming from a person you've been emailing all week. Call and confirm, hear their voice and talk to them. Because at times what people what happen is, is let's say if I'm doing a deal with Sarah or doing a deal with you and an email comes from your email and it could be one thing changed on that email and I don't catch it. And now I have a new routing number, a new account number and I'll call you. Hey, Sarah, this is what I have. Can you confirm this for me? And that one number that's off can send that money directly to someone else. And it happens even in a traditional space that it, a lot of people like to scam because they i don't know i don't know why they like to scam but they have the reasons but if i can change something in a real estate space or in just in a world period i would change all that scam and stuff i don't like it taking advantage of people i don't like it yeah yeah i don't like it either i think that's what makes you a good batman of real estate <laughs> Looking yeah. out for the well-being of people <laughs> yeah shine that light up so i can come out here and, and get these people <laughs> what's um so what's next for you i know we don't have a ton of time left um, oh yeah but any final um what are you looking forward to this year you said you're going to be a sub two student soon yeah 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 so uh the game plan is to get into sub two in february um i finally found a way to get myself in there um i'm very excited to get in sub two because i have met a lot of great people in the sub two community 
Um, I, I've never really been a part of communities until last year when I got into the Gator community and it changed my entire perspective of people in real estate. And I've, I, since I've gotten there, I was able to network and deal with a lot of sub two students. And I've always wanted to be a buy and hold investor. So that's going to be my next thing. Uh, my wife and I are planning on doing, uh, maybe some pad splits, uh, we're looking into some Airbnbs, maybe a couple uh, uh, long-term rentals. Um, my wife is a nurse, so we're also looking into uh, mid-term rentals. So that's the game plan this year, start getting some buy-and-hold investment properties. And uh, we're looking at a couple of different extra strategies, maybe even a couple of wraps, uh, stuff like that. So that's the game plan uh, moving forward is getting this up to um, also getting this up to and help solve problems because – I know in sub two, there's people in there that need TCs, there's people in there that need funds. So I want to be able to get in there and solve problems for people, help people, but also build a wealthy foundation for my family. Nice. Um, are you doing this? Are you, are you, do you tend to invest in the area that you live? I heard this phrase, or is it kind of whatever invest where makes sense? Um, do you have certain markets that you focus in or does it come I heard Pay say the other night that he mostly invests in places that he frequents a lot, like places that he goes to a lot. So that's kind of how I kind of look at things too, because like uh, I want to be able to take a vacation wherever I'm going and I can stop by and check on my property. But like uh, also too, I know certain places uh, I'm not really familiar with. So for me, my market's obviously here locally uh, in the Sacramento area. So San Joaquin County, Sacramento County, uh, Stanislaus County, Yolo County, um, uh, Merced County, stuff like that. Uh, Las Vegas area. I mean, Vegas is right around the corner. We travel there frequently. Um, Houston is an area I want to get into. Uh, Nashville, Tennessee, Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, possibly maybe later on, I'll probably like get in the Virginia area and the Carolinas. But I think I'm just going to right now for the next two to three months, I'm just going to focus locally, get some deals going here, maybe get a buy and hold or something here in the next, say, 60 days here locally. And then I'm going to start marketing out to those other areas like that. But I do already put out my buy box to people that are investing in the area. So if they get something, they'll bring it to me. But as far as me actively looking in those areas, I'll wait until I get some things going here locally first. You said the people who are looking for you in those areas or did I? Yeah. So, so, um, so what happens is, is I end up connecting with wholesalers and I connect with sub two students and they already frequent and work in those markets out there. So what I do is I just send them my buy box for what I like in that area. And if they get something that fit the criteria that I like, then they send it to me. That's kind of, I mean, for my husband and I, we are from Kansas city. And so now we're mm. up here and we've kind of like, well, that makes sense. Actually, we know that market better than anywhere. So that's the next, seems like the next smart step for us. So yeah. Market at home. Yeah. And then it's even better too, because you got family there. So if you need somebody to go look at the property, check out the property, you can always call a relative or a family member to like, Hey, I need you to go walk this property and send me a video. It's way easier for you to do that for me. Like I don't have any family in Houston, so I would have to rely on, somebody out of sub two or gator community or something like that. I've built a relationship with to go and walk a property for me or send me some pictures or, you know what I mean? Stuff like that. Cause I don't live there and I don't have no family there. Yeah. All of those relationships. Relationships are important. Very yeah. important. I actually heard this home inspector recently in a class say like, uh, well, you know, if you were better at building relationships instead of building websites, you know, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> just saying i'm like yeah, yeah that's, that's something that like i feel like my generation <laughs> maybe needs to hear like or just i guess being in seattle there's just a lot of tech and there's just this kind of mm. culture clash of like big tech and big nature up yeah. against yeah those relationships are are are, are key especially mm -hmm. in the real estate world um even in the trucking world and those are the only two worlds i really know is trucking and real estate but in both of those industries, relationships are par paramount to your success in the business because relationships can get you indoors that you probably would never get into on your own. You know what I mean? So even even so, I have buddies that I've built relationships with and became friends with, and I'm trying to go to the WealthCon um, event here in April in, in Las Vegas. And I have a buddy who's like, hey, man, I, I can try to help you get some tickets. You know, I get a discount because I invested in this 
this thing so I can try to give you a, a discount on your ticket. And so for me, not knowing anything, like I know a couple of the speakers, but I don't have a relationship with them. I would have to pay full price. But since I have friends that go to these events, they've been to these events, they have relationships with people at these events, they get a discount. They're willing to allow me to buy my ticket on a discount. So relationships are important. I love them. <laughs> Do you have any final words for maybe um, people who are hesitant to get out and build relationships or maybe they're hesitant to get started on something that they want to do. And it's, you know, that scary first thing. Um, like there's, there's, I've done the, I don't know. what Heart work is a big part of that to me in mm. relationship building. Like I think you said earlier something about like finding those people with the, where their heart is in a similar place as yours. Mm. Um, and for whatever reason, people might be struggling in that in that way, um, but still want to maintain good relationships or build them maybe and they don't have a good starting point. Do you have any yeah. final tips on like that, where, to, where your heart should go, I guess, if you wanted that for yourself? Yeah, I would say for someone that is struggling with getting out or struggling with things, the worst thing that you can do, especially as an entrepreneur, because you know how things is for us. If we don't, if we don't do deals, we don't eat. And that's just flat out what it is. The worst thing you can do is stay in your comfort zone. That is the absolute worst thing you can do is stay in your comfort zone. Because as long as you stay comfortable, you're not going to grow. You're not giving your space. You're not giving your, your career, yourself, your, your space or anything space to grow because you're just in your comfort zone. So um, getting uncomfortable will eventually make that situation comfortable, right? So for me, I wasn't really big on, you know, going out talking to people and trying to tell people what I do and stuff like that um, because I felt like, you know, one, I'm a muscular guy, got all these tattoos, you know what I mean? I don't want to intimidate people, right? And then so... Once, once I learned, hey, smile more, for one, because I really didn't smile much. So me smiling more was me getting out of my comfort zone of always having this just serious look on my face. So getting out of my comfort zone now, I can go up. My wife be like, "Babe, you just always talking about business." Because anywhere that I go, we're gonna talk about some business. We, hey, somehow, some way, we getting on real estate, and it's so everywhere. it's everywhere. Talking about it always, yeah. So, so it'd be funny to me. My wife, she'd just give me this look like, here you go again. And I look at her and be like, well, they started it and now we're <laughs> going to get into it. So just getting out of your comfort zone and getting uncomfortable and eventually it'll become comfortable and then get yourself uncomfortable again. Right. And just really dive into learning your skill or your trade or what you're trying to master or hone in on it. Take time um, and, and really just dive into that craft and ex and become an expert at it and then educate others and have conversations and just really talk to people and you, you you'll start getting vibes of people and listen to what they say people will tell you who they really are you know what i mean and they could try to give you this great scenario of what kind of person they are but eventually you'll see the truth they you know what i mean but i would say if i can tell anybody anything is get out that comfort zone get uncomfortable get uncomfortable with being uncomfortable or be what is that get comfortable with being uncomfortable <laughs> yeah yeah that's a beautiful beautiful final um note to end on i when i moved here i moved to washington because of survival school and that was just a phrase that we i heard over and over and over just get comfortable with the uncomfortable it rains mm. all the time here i'm sure you know it's a rainforest and so just yeah. getting comfortable with the cold and the wet and the dirty and i i that was such a growth edge for me and i I, with learning anything new and um, both with connecting with the environment and the home that is our, our, our land and connecting in new ways with money and pathways to get there and do new things with it. So I think there's, thank you for this conversation today, Eric. We covered all so good, much. All good. All and, good. Easy time. And I, um, I guess what's, what's one thing that gives you hope for humanity? Very final word, because since this is a humanitarian podcast that has a real estate foundation, what gives you hope for humans? I would say I would say that the best thing that I see, I would say that gives me hope for humans is humans. 
I see, I see a lot of people that are good. <clears throat> I see a lot of people that are good. I see a lot of people that have a past of maybe not being the greatest person, but I see a lot of people wanting to be better. Right. And so for me, I came up in a, in a rough childhood. I came up with a rough upbringing. <clears throat> so some of my decisions and choices weren't that great growing up. But once I got into church and I really start giving my life over to God, I start seeing myself in a different light. And I feel like when my prayer got stronger, it gave me the ability to be able to reflect, be able to talk to others and see the goodness in others. And sometimes <clears throat> and me speaking to people, encouraging people, speaking life into people, a lot of people don't have that. So when they get that, it makes them feel great about themselves because they don't have that type of positive encouragement. So people like myself, people like you that walk around and smile at people, encourage people, support people, educate people, people like us is what's going to change the world because it's not a lot of us around. And the more people that we, uh, let's just say like we're like a, a, a great virus. I don't even know if there's a such thing as a great virus, but we're running around and we're infecting people with positivity. We're infecting people with love. We're infecting people with, with support. And what it's going to do is it's going to rub off on them and it's going to, they're going to share that with someone else. It's going to rub off and it's going to continue to flow. And I feel like everybody has greatness and a great heart in them, but some of them have been through some things to where it's kind of in the back because they've been hurt so much. So it's up to uh, it's up to people like us to really help these individuals see that there are positive people, great people, loving people, supportive people, honest people, trustworthy people around here. And that's what gives me hope for humanity because I can see people make bad decisions or have made bad decisions, but also change their life around when they get into and when God gets involved. So for me to be able to see people change their lives around gives me great hope for humanity. Mm. Mm, yeah it's helping welcome them home ain't it yes love yes. is the way amen you give me it hope in humanity, <laughs> you give thank me you thank you thank you thank you so much you're more than welcome anytime